I'm going to talk to you about atomic structure and isotopes. Now, in my brief history of the atom, we left off with Rutherford and, um, and Millikan and some of the incredible discoveries they had. Well, it wasn't until about 20 years later or so in the 1930s that uh, James Chadwick was actually able to discover the neutron the third subatomic particle. See, Rutherford could never account for all of the additional mass, but uh, James Chadwick, using radioactive materials, was able to discover the neutral neutron. So in this table here is a rundown of, of, of what you probably already know, but I need to make sure as we move forward into our discussion of isotopes. So. Um, this atomic structure is in the nucleus, we have the proton and the neutron, each coming in at one atomic mass unit. And then outside of the nucleus, we have electrons, which have a relative mass of zero. Okay, so here is the common notation for showing um, an atom, including its atomic mass number and its atomic number. Remember, the atomic number is the number of protons. So if we want to find the number of neutrons, what do you do? Well, all you do really is you take that atomic mass and you subtract the atomic number. And so if you look at lithium, its atomic mass is seven, and you subtract three, you're going to get four. So um, lithium has four neutrons on average, okay? So that's how we're gonna phrase that until we move into the second part of this video. Now, I'm starting to get pretty fired up because I know that we're gonna get to do some mathematics in this video. Let's get a couple definitions down first. Mainly, the number of protons is the identity. Now that may seem obvious to you, but I want to make darn sure you know there's only one element, one atom, that contains 10 protons, and that would be neon. All right? If you change that number, you change the identity of the atom. Now, numbers of electrons can change. We know that already and numbers of neutral neutrons can also change, all right? And so that leads into our definition for what an isotope is, all right? So let's look at a little example first, and then we'll get those uh, remaining definitions down and move into some mathematics. Example one, what is the atomic notation for chromium? an atom of chromium that has lost three electrons, okay? Let's do that, let's do that real quick. So get out your periodic table, look. And what's the mass of chromium? 52, okay? Your periodic table says 52.00, and the atomic number for chromium, 24, and then it has lost three electrons. Okay, so it's, it's given away three negatively charged subatomic particles, leaving it with a net positive charge. And we're going to write that as a superscript, just like that. Okay? All right. Now, isotopes. Different forms of the same element. So if you think about that prefix, um, you've seen this prefix before. Okay? Iso isotonic, isotropic, isoenzyme, um, isometric, isobutane, isolation, isomer, isopod. All right, so you've seen this prefix before. Iso is a prefix that means equal. So it shouldn't be a surprise that an isotope, different forms of the same element, okay? So it's the same element, but they have a different number of neutrons and therefore a different mass, okay? All right, let's look at this as an example. Let's look at carbon. Nearly 99% of all carbon found in nature 
is carbon-12. Carbon-12 has six neutrons, okay? Six protons, six neutrons. But there are two additional isotopes. There's carbon-13, carbon-14. 13 having seven neutrons, 14 having eight neutrons. So 14 has two additional mass units. So it has a much greater mass relative to carbon-14. All right. So, I want you to also remember that the behavior of a chemical species is determined by its electrons. And you should have a good intuition for that by this point in the course. Okay. So, a mass spectrometer. This is an instrument that can create charged particles and can analyze these particles um, based on a, a deflection and a mass charge ratio, okay? What's amazing about these machines is they can be used to determine the molecular weight. Now, I've mentioned the use of mass spectrometry when we talked about percentage composition. When we did that, we looked at the fragmentation of a compound and how this machine can also be used to identify properties of the compound, all right? So this is what a mass spectrometer looks like, and inside this instrument, there's this device that basically will go through four stages where the particle is charged, so ionization. Then it's accelerated, okay, across two plates. That's the acceleration. The next stage is going to be a magnet causing a deflection. And the final will be the detection and analyzation leading to a mass spectrum. Okay? So if we look at this, um, we're, we're going to find out now it's based on two things. Mass, charge. If all particles are given the same charge, then the only variable is mass. So, the most massive entities will experience the least deflection. So, they're going to be way out here. The less massive particles are going to have a greater deflection, and we'll find them over here. So, this is a really incredible machine, but it comes down to being about that mass to charge or charge to mass ratio. And so the greater that ratio, the more deflection occurs. All right, so two additional definitions here. Relative abundance and relative atomic mass. Relative abundance is the percentage of a particular isotope in nature. You see, not all isotopes are found equally. They're not the same abundances in nature, okay? And we saw that with carbon. Carbon-12 was far more abundant, almost 99%. So this should make sense. Relative atomic mass is that weighted average of all isotopes of an element in nature. You ever wonder why you look at the periodic table and you say, well, lithium 6.97 for the atomic mass. Why isn't it 7? Why, why all these weird numbers? Carbon 12.01. That's because those are the relative atomic masses. Those are the weighted averages. Those are the result of a mathematical computation. And we're going to get to do some good math here coming up. All right. Let's look at a mass spectrum here. So this is a mass spectrum. Remember, this is the end result of that mass spectrometer, and the detection will produce something called a mass spectrum. This is a mass spectrum for zirconium. I want you to note the one, two, three, four, five spectral lines on this spectrum. On the y-axis, you'll typically see relative abundance, or relative intensity, all right? Uh, across the x-axis, we have the, the mass, okay? All right, so looking at this, you should be able to say, if, when I ask you how many isotopes are there for zirconium, you're gonna say, there's five isotopes for zirconium, all right? And the mass spectrum shows us that. 
and I can see that some are more abundant than others. Okay, so take a look here at their relative abundances. All right, zirconium 90 is over half of all zirconium in nature is zirconium 90. And then zirconium 96, there's less than 3% for zirconium 96. So what you're gonna need to do with all these is you're gonna need to multiply the mass by the percentage. And that percentage you're gonna express as a number with a decimal. All right, 50% is 0 0.5, okay? And you're gonna take those and you're gonna add them all up and that's gonna be your weighted average. So it's basically the product of the mass times the percent abundance for each isotope and then add those all up to get the final overall weighted average. Okay, example number two. Finally, we get into some math. All right, so here you're given data from a mass spectrometer, and you're asked to calculate the atomic mass of neon. All right, now you can look at your periodic table and say, neon, 20.18. That's correct. All right, so where does that number come from? It comes from this computation that we're about to do. So let's look at this here. We have three isotopes for neon. Neon 20 is far more abundant. So I'm gonna make a bold prediction. I'm gonna make a prediction that the number we're gonna get when we're done with the math is gonna be pretty darn close to 20. And I think I'm right on that one, all right? So you're gonna take all three of these. You're gonna look at the mass and you're gonna multiply it by the percentage. Now, 90.48 divided by 100 equals 0 0.9048. All right, so I'm laying it out for you. Like I always do, anytime we have our first full-blown example, I'm going to lay it all out because that's the purpose of this. Okay, so here's the formula you're going to use for these three isotopes multiplied by their percent abundance. Let's plug in some numbers here. Once you get the numbers in and you've completed the multiplication, as I said, you add them all up and lo and behold, 20.18 atomic mass units. We must have done something correct, but you know what's powerful with these is being able to make some predictions before you even start. All right, example number three. Boron has two naturally occurring isotopes. Calculate the percent abundance. I'm gonna underline that. Hmm, that's different. Of boron 10 and boron 11 using the following data. Well, it doesn't tell us anything about the percent abundance. So how am I gonna figure this one out? Because what it looks like I have here, even if I call boron 10, X and boron 11, Y. I, I have too many variables. Actually, class, you have two equations and two unknowns, and that's doable. The key is realizing what your second equation is. And I've alluded to this. We've done percentage composition, percentage yield, percentage purity, and now percentage abundance, and a percentage is a number out of 100, okay? So, if we call boron 10x, we can call boron 11 1 minus x, because this is a number out of 100. If you're still not seeing it, if we take the x and y, we can say x plus y equals 1. Now, Rearranging this, it becomes very evident that y is equal to one minus x. So then we can plug that into our expression. Okay, let's look at our, um, our plan again here. The mass times the percent abundance, don't forget. 
We don't know the abundancy, so we're going to be using our x variable and at 1 minus x, and we're going to plug those in. Then you're going to be using the distributive property of multiplication. Rearranging mathematically, combining like terms to get your final answer for x, but we're not done yet. x was born on 10. This problem says abundancies for both. Okay, no worries. 1 minus 0 0.2 equals 0 0.8. All right, and that makes sense. So 1 is 20% abundant, 1 is 80% abundant. Now, time to make a prediction. Boron 11 is way more abundant. And so prediction being atomic mass, or confirmation being rather, my answer should be skewed toward 11. All right, and you see that here because the atomic mass of boron is near 11. It's a little below because boron 10 is pulling it down, but boron 10 is only 20%. So this strategy, this tactic I've implored you to use throughout the course, it's a good way to double check things. Make some predictions about what your numbers should look like. And if they deviate from that, you can go back and double check because you might have made an error. All right, so we have had a discussion here that relates the relative abundance of isotopes to a particular element and the atomic mass of that element. There's a problem set that corresponds to this video, and I will see you guys in class.